All right. Hello. <clears throat> Hello and welcome everybody. We're just getting everyone kind of admitted from the lobby as they're joining. So thanks for joining us. This is uh, our Microsoft 365 and Teams Power User Group session backed by popular demand. Um, we uh, are taking a little bit of different approach this year. So for those of you who have joined us last year, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of an update. Uh, it'll also provide some context to those who are here uh, for the first time, uh, which is that uh, we were doing them for about a half an hour, um, like our regular sessions, Microsoft sessions we've been doing, um, and we were doing them every month. Well, when we really looked at that, we figured that um, uh, because we're trying to go deeper technically into the information, we decided to do these uh, in a rhythm of every other month, but go deeper. So go an hour instead of, a, instead of 30 minutes. Uh, because we are trying to go deeper into the technology to really tee up and, and help enable folks uh, in different organizations with power users. So uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. This is our first one of the year, so thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like to, um, my name is Nathan Austin. I'll be uh, behind the scenes for the most part. Gerald's going to be leading us through the session today. Um, and I'd like to ask everyone as they're coming in, I know that uh, people are mostly muted, uh, so please do that. Um, and let's use the raise the hand um, feature, or actually, uh, for the most part, we're going to be going into the uh, Q and A uh, towards the end, um, but go ahead and raise your hand in the middle because if there's things that we might go through, Gerald, I imagine you're okay with that um, because there might be some good stuff to uh, to poke uh, and add some context. So we always appreciate that. Um, so yeah, mute your mic. Uh, please uh, ask questions. Use the chat conversation um, or raise your hand. Uh, and then uh, at the end, uh, we, we've got some polls that, that we've got going on throughout the session, as well as in our survey that we send afterwards uh, with the recording. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, and uh, again, just to put the context of, and Gerald's going to go into this a little bit more, but there's kind of a couple people that we appreciate <clears throat> um, or that we want to invite or, or encourage to participate in these sessions. One of them is what we call the power user. And again, Gerald, I know you're going to go to that to the next slide uh, in the, as a power user. The other one is, uh, in fact, I just heard this term on a call I was on recently, is, is more of a champion, uh, meaning that there's someone inside the organization that really can help drive adoption uh, and help uh, maybe train the trainer kind of people that can, can really help move things forward. So those are the kind of folks that we're hoping to target this communication with. We're going to go deeper into the technology um, uh, as opposed to just seeing a higher level business objectives that we've done in other sessions. Um, and before we dig in all that, before I hand it over to Gerald, we're going to spend one minute on my tech, I promise, uh, just one minute. Um, <clears throat> we are a business technology and consulting organization that works with small and medium organizations. Today, it's in the Twin Cities and Denver metropolitan areas. Um, we are looking to expand and uh, have an office in Cincinnati. Uh, so that's something I always like to mention in case there's other folks out there. So we're going to be doing that. Um, one of the things that we've learned over 20 years of being in business together is that we have defined a proven IT strategy. It doesn't mean it's the only IT strategy out there. It's just one that we know that when employed, we can deliver with our clients consistent and proven results. Um, and that's oftentimes what our clients want from us is like, we want to have IT not really be a problem. I don't want to think about it. doesn't mean I don't want to be involved in conversations and discussion. It just means that I want to try and remove some of those challenges that may be IT related. So that's what our strategy tries to do for you. Um, ultimately, we want to make IT easy because you, your job is not working on IT. It's it's to focus on serving your customers or your clients better and being more adaptable to other business challenges. And together, what we say is uh, our clients achieve four times more value and productivity from their IT investments by employing this IT strategy over time. So uh, that's not why you're here today. Um, so we will move on. But uh, if you'd like to have a conversation about that, by all means, raise your hand, let us know. We'd happy to chat further. Uh, but otherwise, um, Gerald, take it away and uh, guide us through the February uh, Microsoft 365 and Teams Power User Group session. Thanks a lot, Nate. Um, yeah, so I just want to reiterate um, kind of what we identify these power users as, right? Because this is this is one of those things that a lot of people think you have to be an IT person in order to be, you know, really influential inside of the the operation of of your of your how your environment uses technology, and that's not actually the case, right? You don't have to have all the skills to be able to program and develop all the things in the background. Um, really, what we need is you know, me being a very technical person, I need somebody that can help me drive that adoption inside the organization. They can understand the pros and the cons of what is being done inside the business. And if I make a change or a, if we're gonna set something up a certain way, why do we wanna set it up that way? 
um, and really understands what their organization is trying to do with that technology, how they're going to use it, um, and helps you know ultimately lead their organization in making those appropriate IT decisions. So that should hopefully be all of you in this in this call, and you're going to learn some some heavier duty stuff. We aren't going to get into like all of the individual items of how to set up every little component inside this, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the pros and cons of a lot of the things that we're going to, or a lot of the, the kind of business decisions you have to make when you start setting things up. So our agenda today, we're going to be talking about moving your files to SharePoint, right? How to move these files to SharePoint, do some of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and ultimately our agenda today is we're going to recap some of these older sessions that we've done just to kind of give you some background. Um, I know that Stephanie will add a uh, add a link in our uh, in our follow up email that will basically talk about you know hey if you want to go watch one of those that you've missed so you can get some some uh, follow up of that information that'd be great uh, but then we're going to talk about why you want to move to SharePoint right what are these benefits um, what are some of the restrictions around what we're doing what are the um, what are SharePoint lists how do they integrate in with what we're doing um, team sites versus communication sites what are the pros and cons of all that um you know what are the securities and permissions how does that work you know inside of the business uh and then even creating a legacy experience and then we'll try to wrap this up with a little bit of demo so i'm not going to completely bore you with powerpoint overload today um so previously what have we learned previously right so sharepoint um in previous sessions we learned that sharepoint is kind of a core foundation of a lot of different areas of of the environment it is you know it is the background of a lot of the teams infrastructure it's the background of a lot of the planner um, SharePoint obviously so it, it's just kind of a key component in all of this and as we start drilling through this we're going to see how that all integrates together uh, we also learned that m365 groups are a key feature to the security of 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 the 365 platform right so there's a special kind of group that has these um, they have special attributes assigned to them. So when you create them, uh, for example, creating a Teams team, uh, when you create a team inside Teams, you actually create a 365 group. And with that 365 group, it also has the ability to become the, the permissioning structure for Planner, for um, Teams, for SharePoint, for a lot of different areas. And that's actually becoming a very key component in the in the SharePoint environments now. Yeah. Um, we also learned about Teams file storage. So, um, you know, when you when you share a file inside Microsoft Teams, you're actually sharing that file inside of a special SharePoint site. Um, if you are sharing a file in a Teams chat, you're actually sharing that from your OneDrive, um, knowing what the difference of that is, what are the pros and cons of all of that kind of stuff, and how to access those files in the background. Uh, we've also learned about building SharePoint sites. How do we start from a SharePoint site? What is the difference between uh, a communication site, a team site, a hub site. Um, how do you how do you build some of those structures that you would actually need in order to do what we're going to do today? Um, we also went through page editing in SharePoint. So how to actually build you know kind of that inf intranet infrastructure that you'd be looking at, um, and then the use and the power behind lists. Um, lists is a is a component of SharePoint. It's kind of, uh, for lack of better terms, it's the database side of SharePoint that allows you to build uh, very flexible um, tables of information. Uh, and we're going to get into a little bit of that even today as we show you how how that uh, attributes to files. Um, one of the other things that we talked about, and I kind of want to review because this is key to some of the stuff that we're going to look at today, is how site permissions work inside SharePoint. So um, there are multiple layers of permissions inside SharePoint, um, site admins, site owners, site members, and site visitors, and we can assign certain rights to those different tiers, right? So, or different people to those rights. So we can actually have people that have permissions to edit files, not view edit files, view files, some of that kind of stuff. So this is kind of just a, a brief overview of, hey, these are the revisions of everything that we've got that we have to uh, kind of keep in mind as we start talking about permissioning inside of the, uh, the file structures. Um, one of the other things I like to cover here quick is um, is showing that we're talking about SharePoint, right? So SharePoint is a component that is spread across the entire environment, right? So this is uh, basically no matter what plan you have, if you have one of the full productivity suite plans, so any of the business plans, the old plans, or the Microsoft plans, you have SharePoint. So really just kind of a, a key component to show that this is ubiquitous across the whole system. 
So, all of that out of the way, why do you want to use SharePoint, right? This is the question that everybody starts asking about. Why would I want to move all my files up there? I'm very happy with my file server sitting next to me. Um, well, there's a lot of reasons actually. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to cover some of the high level ones here. Um, one of the big ones is anywhere access, right? Because it is sitting up inside the Microsoft Cloud, you now have the ability to access those files from anywhere, basically at any time. As long as you can get onto the internet, you can access those files. Um, you don't have to build a VPN, you don't have to do anything else. It's all secured via uh, SSL encryption. It's, it's safe and uh, secure to store that kind of stuff. Now it does require some, you know, some thought because of that. Um, you might not want to set, uh, you know, um, certain kinds of security up there, but that is one of those things that you have to kind of think about is, hey, this is, this is anywhere now. I can access this from anywhere, anytime. Um, it also is really easy to share those files externally. So if you want to, um, it's also easy to block it too, luckily. So, um, but if you want to share those files externally, how do you actually get the file out there to share that to, um, you know, to another group or maybe share files outside your organization? Um, maybe a client, you want to share files back and forth with a client or a, or a peer. You can do that kind of stuff with SharePoint. We're trying to do that with a local file server, usually requires some kind of external software or special VPNs um, and just a lot more work. Um, indexing and search. Uh, this is this is this is one of my favorite features, honestly. Um, is the ability to search for something. I can just type in the name of a of a file, or even better, the contents of a file, and I can pull up those files no matter where they sit. Um, it it spreads across not only the areas that um, that I'm thinking of when I'm looking for that file, but even areas that are outside of that. Anywhere that I have access, I can see that file. Um, Versioning, this is kind of a neat part. You know, uh, if, if you've been around in IT or worked with computers long enough, you probably remembered having to save that file. This is V1, V2, V3, V4, um, just so that if you, you know, oh man, what happened, you know, in my last save, you go back a couple just to make sure that, you know, you can figure out what happened. SharePoint by default keeps all of those versions for you. So you can actually go back and look at that change history, see when things changed. Um, you also get the ability of automation. I think this is this is a pretty cool thing too. Um, using actions like um, Microsoft Flow or Power Automate, as it's now called, um, Power Automate gives you the ability to actually take action. So you can actually say, when a file is updated, notify people, uh, send an email, do something like that. It's outside the scope of what we're going to show you today, but really cool what you can do with that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's even some enhanced uh, security features. So you can actually um, with the appropriate licensing on the 365 platform, many of that is additional licensing, depending on what plan you're on. Um, but there are ways of actually taking that content and doing um, lockdowns of that. So you can actually encrypt that data so that if it, can, if it ever does leave your organization, people can't read it. Um, control who has access to that, when they have access, where they have access to that data from. Um, you can do some really cool stuff, but that only really happens if you start with it inside SharePoint. So, because of all this, we figured out that we want to move to SharePoint, right? That's that's hopefully where we're at in our decision at this point. Um, so, let's plan this migration, right? Well, just copy all the files up there, right? It's that easy, um, but it isn't. Uh, there's a lot of things you really have to think about. SharePoint is not a file server. It can act as though it's a file server, but it is not a file server. It is has some fundamental differences in the way that it operates. And because of this, we have to think about things in a little bit different state. So one of the things that we have to start with is we need to identify our data. What data do we want to move up to SharePoint, right? Is this a good opportunity for us to reorganize our data? Is our current file structure meeting what we're doing? Um, is there old data out there? Is there data that we haven't touched for 20 years? Um, do we still need that? Do we just archive that off, put it on, you know, on some kind of a stable media and, and store it separately instead of trying to keep it up on SharePoint all the time. Um, and then even there's even questions like, how does that data get created? If you have uh, an ERP solution or a primary business solution that is generating these files and trying to save them out um, as part of its automation, that may not work to move that file to SharePoint, right? There may be still a process to actually manually move that file to get it up into SharePoint. And can you automate that? Can you not? What are those actions? Um, is it, you know, if it's somebody sitting at uh, sitting at their computer using Word, that's one way. But if it's that automation process that we're trying to save that data for, um, it may have some complications in trying to do this. 
Um, we also have to think about what is going to be our method of how we migrate this data. There's multiple different ways of looking at this. Um, you know, a couple of common ones about a like more of a manual move versus a cutover type style. But you know, there's there's pros and cons to both of those. Um, we have to look at the structure of this data. Um, there's there's different advantages that you get when you start moving to SharePoint. So it's not just about uh, your typical file folder structure that you have right now. Um, there's a lot of features that we're going to get into that will actually let you um, treat that more as though it's data itself um, instead of just files and folders. Um, there's some restrictions around naming conventions. You may have certain ways that you're setting up files right now that aren't going to be compatible with the way that we move it to. So we have to think about some of that kind of stuff. There's some path lengths, there's character lengths, there's character, you can only use certain characters even. Um, so some of that is is different. Uh, and then even like your personal drives, your home drives, before you can get rid of that file server, you may have moved all your common business data up there, but do you still have um, you know, your, your personal drives or your home drives listed? Do you still have items on your desktop or your, your documents on your computer? Is that redirected to the server? We have to consider all of that kind of stuff and figure out how to safely migrate and store that data too. So um, migration methods, we'll start here, right? This is, this is one of our first thought processes we kind of have to think about is how are we going to move this data up? Um, and, and really it comes down to two different pieces. There's either a manual way to do it or an automatic way. Um, and just like everything else, pros and cons to it all. Um, the manual move is obviously a manual process, but it does let you convert at your own pace. It might be taking blocks of files, dragging them into SharePoint or using a tool to transfer that data. Um, the cool part about that is, is that you can actually, you know, learn and adapt and change how you're doing things as you start using that platform. Um, you can even change even the design of what you're doing. You can say, oh, you know what, those files that we moved up there, that really didn't work that way. Let's, the next batch of files that we move up, let's put it in a different way so that it goes up there in a, in a more easily um, uh, use, used format. Um, there's also, um, you know, you're kind of learning and adapting your personal operations, right? Every every employee is learning as you move those files up how to do that. Um, the training is more more spread out in that process, um, but you know it it can it can also drag out too in that whole in that sequence. Uh, and it's also a lot easier to only move the data you want as you're looking through this. Um, this is really this is really advantageous if you've got a very messy folder file structure that you're trying to clean up and reorganize. The more complicated those rules are, the more difficult it is to automate those kinds of things. So this may be one of those easy processes is actually if you've got a lot of cleanup to do, this may be the method that's that's preferred for you. Um, the downfall is it takes a long time, right? It is a manual process. Somebody's gonna have to help drive this. Um, but it is something that doesn't require like highly skilled technical talent to do. It can be done by a lot of, um, by, by most, or, most organizations themselves. Um, the other way to do this is actually a cutover migration. So this is an automated upload. Um, we take everything that's in your file structure as it sits right now, and we just put it up into SharePoint. Um, it works, it's doable, um, but there's a lot more upfront training as to how SharePoint operates differently. Um, it's an all at once cutover. So you've got, um, this is, you're gonna be working one day on your file server to the next day you're gonna be working in SharePoint. Um, so it is kind of more of a, more of an abrupt change. Um, it also has uh, some of those limited organization, reorganization options, some of that kind of stuff. But if you've already got a working file system and you know it's gonna work inside SharePoint, it's really easy just to plop that up there and be done with it and, and start, start moving the new way. Um, the other thing we have to think about is where are we going to store this data? So we have SharePoint and we have Teams. Um, if, you, if you've worked with us and you've seen some of our other sessions, you'll know that there's uh, Teams is ultimately founded on SharePoint. So a lot of the background work that you'll see inside Teams is going to be SharePoint. Now, there are some differences about how security works in these two platforms. So um, where do I put my file then, right? I could use Teams or I could use SharePoint. SharePoint is going to be the place if you want complex security. So if you want to be able to control who can read that file, who can write to that file, who can uh, add files, do all that kind of stuff, 
you're going to want to have that file structure inside SharePoint. Even though the team side of things is in SharePoint, we want to actually have a special site that is dedicated strictly to that and not tied to teams. Um, the benefit of teams is when you add somebody to the team, they gain access to all those files. So if you're doing a lot of collaboration, um, teamwork, departmental work, Teams is a great place to store some of that data. Um, it really makes it easy to put that into its structure, to put it all right there, to easily give somebody access to it. As soon as you make them a member of that team, they have access to all the files. Um, it, it just, it's just, it's right there. A lot of times we think of this as ultimately the working document. So if you have any kind of change control, document control inside your organization, uh, maybe an ISO group or um, just have really formal change control inside your business, this is a good way of placing your working documents uh, or your master documents inside the Teams environment. That's the place where your teams collaborate, they build the documents, but then when you publish that, you actually publish that to SharePoint. And now you can put controls on that to say who can access that file. Only certain people can publish that data. Only certain people can modify that data. Um, and, and it really locks it down. So now you've got that, that change control really in place. Um, the other big difference between SharePoint and Teams is who can manage access to that. In SharePoint, you need to have some kind of an admin right in order to change who has what rights. Um, the security is done at the site level. It's it's a little bit more complex in a nature uh, in the way it's designed and the way it needs to be set up. Teams is managed at the team level. So if you are the team owner, you automatically get the rights to be able to um, add new users and modify users exclude users, do all that kind of stuff to that team, which is automatically giving and, and removing rights to the files. So now we've decided where we're gonna put this. We're gonna say, hey, let's put this in SharePoint or we're gonna put this out there. We need to figure out how we're gonna organize this data. Um, most of the time, files are stored in something called document libraries. Document libraries are basically just a pre-formatted version of a SharePoint list. So if you attended our, sh our list session last time, um, you'll know what, the, uh, what a list is, but a list is basically a database table. So if you think of uh, ultimately using like Excel and having a worksheet where you have cells and columns and rows, um, this is basically what we're doing is every file we upload is a row in that table. And we can, we can change things by adding columns of data, what we call metadata, if we want. So what's kind of neat about this is by adding this metadata, we get some additional features to what we do. But we can also build folders inside there. So a item could be either a file or a folder. We can then put those folder structures in place. We can basically emulate exactly what you're doing on your, um, on your current system. Um, we can also have multiple libraries. So a single site can have multiple libraries and you can have multiple sites. So now we can actually go very deep in structures as to breaking out what each of those are. Maybe it's building a library per primary folder that you have on your current file server. Maybe it's building a site per primary folder. Some of this is gonna depend upon how you intend to use it and how you intend to apply rights. Um, if you apply rights at those, at those primary folders, it might be as easy to say, we're gonna do it at a site level. Um, if you're gonna apply rights at you know, multiple layers deep, um, maybe we need to kind of shuffle and elevate some of those into more primary sites versus the libraries themselves. But you know, a lot of, lot of options that can be played through as to how that looks, how that gets organized, and how that gets you know, kind of controlled from, on the security side of things. So that metadata that we talked about, what is metadata? Well, metadata is basically additional columns of information that we can place on those files. So a lot of people don't realize this, but on the technical side, if, if you actually were to pull up the attributes of a file on your computer, there is actually metadata there. It's just not as, um, it's not as fluid as what we get inside SharePoint. So you get certain pieces of pre-built metadata that are um, what we call attributes in the, on the PC world. And those attributes are things like read-only, um, it's an archive bit, it's you know, the date that it was written, the date that it was saved last, you know, all that kind of stuff. All that exists on the files already, but we also get the ability to add additional columns. And some of these columns might be as simple as, you know, who put that file there? Um, but we can even get more complex and we can add uh, unique items. Like we can say, what is the PO of this file? If we've got a list of all of our 
all of our invoices from our vendor, we can actually add a column that says, what is this PO? So now if we're trying to find a PO, we don't have to look through all of those files. We can actually say, give me a sort or index this information and make it searchable. So I can actually search for this PO and it's gonna give me all the documents that have that PO related to it. One of the other neat things about this is how many times have you ever wanted to have that file in multiple locations? On your traditional file server, what did you have to do? You had to copy that file multiple times every time you, every space you wanted that file at. Well, in this, in using metadata, we can build a sort that that file is associated with multiple objects. It might be associated with multiple um, ways of, of filtering that data or organizing that data. Um, and, and because of that, because we can add it to multiple places, when every, whenever we change our views or our filters, that automatically kind of sorts out our data for us. So we can kind of do some really cool methodology of doing that. Um, the entry of this data can either be done through drop-down lists, so actually selecting values that are already predefined, or we can leave it as manual entry, so you can actually enter in kind of free text or form fields that, uh, that you would want. So metadata sounds really cool, right? Why would I want to use this over uh, over folders? Hey, Gerald. Um, yes. There was a question that came in that uh, I'm going to ask it now, but okay. you, you may be going through the process of answering it, so I just wanted to get, put it on your radar. It says, if we have a document file uh, slash file in a library and move the file into another library, does the column move with the file into the new library? Um, and I guess there's probably an, ex I think I know the, the exact answer to that, but I think there's an expanded answer. That is, does any other metadata potentially move uh, with that file? So I'll, I'll be quiet and uh, see if there's a, an answer coming or how, how you might answer that. So that's actually a, a really good question. Um, so yeah, the, uh, um, so metadata is defined on a library per library state. So every library has to have its own metadata um, or its own definition of what that metadata is. If you have two libraries that have the same metadata structure and you move an object from those two, it should copy the metadata. And there are ways that if not, you can build automations that will do that for you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, uh, by default it does not because those columns of data are not defined potentially in that new library. So that is that is one of those catch 22 that's that's a very good question. Um, and you can actually kind of combine the two so you can actually build folders. But when you build folders that metadata is defined at the very top level. So even if you were to do um, like if I were to think of like finance you might have um, you might have uh, AP and AR underneath like a finance archive of data. You might want different sets of data for each of those folders. The problem is is the data that you're going to put on that finance archive structure is going to have the same structure no matter where it's at. And so you might actually want to build two separate libraries for that financial archive data, one for AP and one for AR. But yeah, excellent question. Thanks, Nate, for uh, pointing that out. Um, so folders versus metadata, right? Metadata sounds awesome. Why would I want to use folders? Folders are what I'm used to. Why would I want to use metadata? Um, this is this is this is the big battle in SharePoint. Um, it, and some of this is, you know, there's just like everything else. There's some pros and cons, right? Metadata gives us that ability to classify and organize data in different ways. Um, if anybody's ever played in Excel and understands the power of pivot tables, you immediately start understanding the power of being able to look at this data in different ways. Um, it also gives multiple ways of viewing that same data, right? So we can have, like I talked about earlier, where we have that, that file that's in multiple locations now because we can see this and change this in a heartbeat. Um, it's also better for new people. This, is, this sounds kind of counterintuitive, but um, because there's no folder structure, I don't have to figure out what's four or five levels deep in order to find that folder I'm looking for. I can actually just search for the data or identify the data based upon the columns that I'm looking for. It's actually a lot easier to find information if you're not familiar with the environment. Now, there are downfalls with metadata. Um, there's additional labor to set them up, right? Every time you add a file, you have to assign that metadata or else it doesn't provide you any value. Um, and you can't see this information, so we're gonna talk a little bit later about how we can actually look at this in the file explorer view, kind of more of a legacy format, but that data doesn't exist. We can't see that metadata in anything other than the web browser-based system. 
So kind of a kind of a catch twenty two with trying to use this. You you get one way of using it. It's really powerful, but it's only that one way of using it. So folders. How do folders work? Well, folders actually have a lot of pros too. We can actually assign permissions at each of those folder levels. So we can actually say this folder has different permissions than the folder above it. Now, in order to get to that folder, you have to have permissions to at least see that folder, much like you do underneath Windows still, but you can actually put those controls in place to kind of um, help protect what's going on. Um, end users can create new folders. So metadata, in order to set up metadata, you have to be an old owner of that site. Um, users can enter data into the metadata that you've defined, but the structure of building that metadata structure requires you to be a site owner. Folders, any user that has access to create an object inside that SharePoint site has the ability to create a folder. Makes it pretty easy for them to be able to do stuff. They can build their own or enhance the structure as they see fit. They want to add another field, they can add another field or another, another folder to the structure because they've got maybe a new category of data that they need to put inside there. Um, if you're trying to limit that access and you want to actually build that into that metadata structure, you have to be the site owner in order to add that information. Um, Downfall. There's only one way to organize it. When you put a file into a folder, it's in the folder. Um, and if you ever move that file, that changes not only the information like where that file is, but it also changes the URL that is used to access that and any links that might exist to that file. So sharing uh, links that you maybe have saved, all of your pre-used documents. This is actually very common, like you'd see um, if you moved a file on your file server all of that path is gonna change and it's gonna be breaking things when you do that. So, metadata also has a couple of other, uh, I like to call them catch 22s, right? Just little things that you need to worry about that, uh, that might change you know, your mind about how you use metadata and when you use metadata. So, metadata can be either set as optional or required when you, when you set up the schema for metadata. And if you make a required metadata field, you're basically forcing the entry of that data as soon as you put that file in. Before that file actually, before that record that stores that file actually gets saved, you have to meet all the required data. Um, the downfall of this is if you don't have that data, it's hard to get, right? It's, it's one of those things that requires you to do some of that. It also blocks the ability to save files using like the File Explorer Sync features. So if I were try to use the, his, the more legacy version of, of File Explorer Sync to save a file up to a SharePoint site, that doesn't work um, if it's a required field. As soon as we try to do that, it's gonna say, this folder is locked, you can't upload data remotely via this. You can read the data, but you can't, uh, and you can do some changes, but you can't actually add files because there is a required field inside there. Um, now, Microsoft has gotten around some of this. If you're using any of the, um, the modern, so I'm going to say in like the last six-ish months of, of Office applications that have been updated, then you actually get a feature when you go to save a file into a information store that has a required field. It actually brings up a little bar on the side and actually asks you for those fields of information. It's kind of slick. It really is nice um, <laughs> because before you couldn't even save from those applications. So you usually had to go create a file, fill out the information, and then and then open it and edit it, which was a lot of work. Um, now, there is a way around this. We can build optional fields in metadata. Now, there's a downfall to this. By making it optional, there is no guarantee that it's going to get filled out. But uh, Microsoft has made this really easy by actually creating a view that says, identify the objects that don't have the appropriate metadata. And it actually gives you a whole list of, of fields or of, of objects that don't have metadata that you can fill out. So it makes it really easy to identify what objects need to be done. Um, and this also then, because we aren't requiring that data, that allows us to use that file explorer sync again. So we can use that OneDrive sync to actually access files back and forth. So we've got our files, we've got everything figured out. We're, we know what we're gonna do. There's some other catch 22s that we also need to worry about, right? So um, a lot of people don't think of this, but there is actually, um, there are limits on a file server as to how many folders you can ever go. Um, there's also limits like how long of uh, a name on a file can be. That same kind of thing exists also in the document libraries in SharePoint. Now, ultimately, the URL length is pretty long. 
Um, we say it's at a premium because, you know, 400 characters goes away pretty fast. Um, but, you know, it includes a lot of information that you don't necessarily think about it including. So it's also going to, it's going to include things like your tenant name, the SharePoint.com, the sites, the site name, all of this stuff all goes inside that. After that, there's the, the document library name, there's the folder that you've got and the subfolder and the subfolder and the subfolder and then the file name all have to sit inside this 400 character limit. If it's longer than that, you will get errors or you won't be able to save the file. Um, so because of that, we have to think about how we name some of our folders, name our files, name our structures, those kinds of things. Um, we also, because of the way that things are indexed, uh, we don't want to build multiple uh, document libraries that have highly generalized words, right? No stuff, other, um, you know, just even the term information, you know, you use these words, we can think of that because we're thinking of it maybe in the old way of the file server. I maybe have an other underneath finance and an other under operations, but if I'm searching for other, what one do I get? Am I getting the documents that I'm really looking for? Um, this really makes that search difficult, uh, and, and it's a lot better if we can just kind of be more descriptive about what we're talking about. These are other invoices. These are other documents that are tied to X project, something like that. Um, one of the ways that you can get around some of these length considerations when we're talking about libraries is, um, is to actually change the name of the library after we set the URL. So we could actually come up with a, you know, uh, a fairly short but descriptive name to that um, to that library initially, and then rename it to a much more descriptive name that would actually give us the ability to keep that character limit down while still using uh, visibly things that mean more to us. Um, yeah. Um, we also have to think about this when we're talking about column design and metadata because that metadata is searchable. We have to be clear about what that column represents and what data is inside that. Um, if you're ever going to use abbreviations, because everybody, you know, when you're looking at a table, you want to keep some of that stuff short. Uh, we want to make sure that we're um, that we're using the descriptions on it to keep, so we could say like a PO field for uh, for you know maybe purchase orders, but inside the description we'd actually say purchase order number so that we actually define what we're looking for. The other thing that's really use uh, more of a user benefit. Um, in the state is to actually create something that matches the data type. So if you're intending the PO number to be a number, make sure that we set it to be a number type and not a text field. Because if we make it generic text, somebody might not understand what information needs to be put into there. But if it only accepts numbers, it's going to make it a lot easier to identify, probably looking for the PO number. Um, and then we also want to keep some of that data sanitary. So we want to be able to keep that exactly what we're expecting it to. And to do drop-down lists is how we do that. So building a drop-down list or a predefined set of data that can be used inside that, that column is, is how we'd control some of that kind of stuff. Now, there's also one last area we have to think about when we're doing all this is there are the no no characters. Uh, many of these exist in your file server also, but there are a few here that are unique to SharePoint. So the quotes, the double quotes, the asterisk, the greater than and less than symbols, the question mark, forward and backslash, and the pipe are no good period. You can't use any of that kind of stuff at all. Now, there are some symbols that are kind of allowed, and I'm putting this in like little air quotes um, because because they, they can be used, but only in certain circumstances. You can't always be able to use the tilde, the ampersand, the curly brackets, and the period. Um, you don't want to have multiple periods inside your document. It confuses the system as to what the file type is, some of that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's two that are especially special because they could be allowed, but they might not be allowed depending upon how your system is set up. And that's the percent sign and the pound sign. Uh, the, both of those are, um, you have to make some changes to your environment, but that does allow you to do that. Where we see this used a lot is, uh, Groups that might have um, bin numbers or apartment numbers or house numbers, stuff like that, where they are using the, the pound sign in a lot of their day-to-day uh, -day operations. Um, we can use that still. We can. We just have to enable that feature on the SharePoint site before we try to convert any of those files, because if you try to do it by default, 
it does uh, it does reject it, saying that that file is invalid. So, um, last area that we have to figure out how to move this data from is our personal data, um, home folders, that kind of stuff. How do we get some of this? Well, if you've attended any of our other sessions, you'll know that the perfect place for this is actually to move this into OneDrive. That is really what that data is meant for. OneDrive is your personal storage point. Um, we can do this, and the best way to do this is to do it through a automated migration. We just pick up the data that's either on your computers, on those shared points on the server, whatever it might be, and we just dump it up right inside that. It's a lot easier because everybody's kind of had their, um, uh, their, their chance to organize it their own way. Uh, and we don't necessarily need to rethink that before we can put that up there. Um, we also, but one of the things that we probably want to do is there's also a chance that there's a lot of old junk data out there too. Um, and before we spend all the time trying to upload that, fix that data, do anything else that we have to do, uh, we probably want to run, you know, hey, let's have a spring cleaning party and ask everybody to clean up that data inside their, their, uh, their home folders before we actually move that data up to the system. Um, once we get that data up there, you maybe are using a feature already called redirected folders. Redirected folders um, move like your desktop, your documents, some of that kind of stuff to the server. There's a similar function for this in OneDrive. I don't like this term, but it's called a backup mode. Um, and you can actually say, I want the desktop, the documents, and the pictures actually backed up into OneDrive. And it will actually build folders just like redirected folders. It actually redirects those folders but it gives you that same synchronization feature, does all that kind of stuff. Things on your desktop automatically become um, always cached on your computer. So you get some of those kinds of features right there, right then. Um, but you get these, these abilities to point those folders into that structure. Uh, most of the time when we set this up in an automated fashion, you want to set this up automatically so that all those files, even if they weren't being redirected before, are now also being backed up just to keep, keep them safe and to keep that data if you ever had any kind of problem on the PC, that information is recoverable now. So we've got all our data up there, but we don't like using the browser, right? Um, how do we do the deal with that? Well, the easy way to do this is OneDrive Sync. So um, OneDrive, the same tool that we use, that's uh, that we use to synchronize our our personal OneDrive data, can also be used to share, synchronize those SharePoint libraries. Um, we can dump that data back and forth. We can see that as a single folder. Uh, we can either do a, a whole structure of, of a document library, or we can do individual folders. We can drill down into a folder. Now you can't do a filter of that information. Um, so if you are using metadata, you can't use a view or a filter to synchronize. If you use uh, metadata and you say synchronize, it is going to synchronize all data no matter what. Um, this data does follow the modern synchronization rules if you're using the new OneDrive client, and that will allow you to have the always in the cloud, the always on the device, and all of those kinds of features, uh, and that temporary caching that does happen when you open up a file. Um, it is accessible right from the file explorer. So if you have legacy applications, uh, if you're you know just even users uh that, that have problems trying to use the browser side or you want to restrict them how they're doing it or they're just used to using the file explorer they can still utilize that it's just going to be a little bit different structure it's not a map drive anymore it's now going to be just a uh, it's going to be a different icon inside their their file explorer system uh it's also really good if you have problem internet access so if you've got you know you're out you're out where you don't have stable internet maybe you are, are using uh, 4g um wireless devices something like that um this process, because of that caching, allows you to work with and save those files on a better basis because it slowly feeds that information in the background um, and allows for better access while you're, while you're working on that file, kind of speeds up some of that data. It's also really good if you're offline or airplane access, that kind of stuff, you can cache those files um, and work on them while you're, uh, while you're on the plane or while you're disconnected from, from other forms of communication. Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out is while this is really great and it works really well for all of these things, one of the things it does not work well for is files that are highly modified. So if you've got a lot of people that are constantly working in a file, maybe it's an Excel file that four or five people shared that you're constantly changing all throughout the day, and you're trying to use the synchronization technology to keep it up to date for offline access, um, 
it it's it's problematic. Um, you can sometimes get to the state where it doesn't know how to synchronize that data back and forth, and then it's just going to throw you a bunch of errors and require you to basically reset how you're set set up for that. Um, so don't recommend trying to cache it, cache uh, highly modified files. You can still link it, but you just don't try to cache it offline. Okay. Cheryl, there's a question that came up uh, in the chat here um, yep. talking about um, admin permission to uh, like the the individual OneDrives, you know, which is typically the OneDrive dash company name. Um, and uh, talking about how do we like, it seems like the question is part, well, partly, why would we want people to use in uh, different team members, employees to use though that OneDrive versus say the corporate SharePoint or Teams? Um, and or like just how do you encourage them uh, to to try and to use that environment and, and why do we even have the OneDrive personal storage capacity anyway? <laughs> um, that's all a very good question. Um, so um, it, it depends, I guess, is the answer, right? Um, what you're trying to do and how you're trying to use that data is really what's going to define what you're what's set up for that um, um, where that data should go. So if you're if you have a, um, how would I put this? If you're working through this and and like like if I'm working, I'm I'm building my first set of the doc. I'm I'm I've got a heavy draft I'm working on. That file usually sits inside my OneDrive. I like having it in my OneDrive because I have access to it no matter where I'm at. My computer disappears, either it's stolen, it breaks, it, whatever it happens. I don't have to worry about losing that data. I don't have to worry about losing that draft. I have access to it no matter what. I can switch between my phone and my computer, move and back and forth and use that same file, constantly editing it. Now when I reach it to a point where I want to start collaborating with somebody, maybe I've reached that point where that draft is finalized and I actually want to start working with somebody on it, that's the perfect point to move it into Teams now. right? I take that file, put it into Teams, start using it inside there, um, and, and working with it there with everybody else. Then maybe it's now the Teams work through it, we've identified this, maybe it's a process that we just wrote or a policy, we can now publish that to a SharePoint site where we're locking it down so that the company has access to read that file, but nobody can write to it. So we don't have to worry about anybody changing that document unless they have permission to. So I guess hopefully that answers the question. And if it doesn't, will you please speak up so that I can uh, I can address it further? So far, so good, Gerald. Okay. Um, I, let's let's do a demo because I think I've been yabbering about some of this boring stuff for way too long now already. Um, okay, so uh, I've got here, I've got our SharePoint site. This is just a simple SharePoint site that we built out earlier. Um, I've decided I need to build a uh, document library to put all this in. Sounds difficult, right? Actually, it's not. We're going to say new. We're going to say document library. This is how easy this is. What do we want to call this document library? Well, let's call it um, uh, product. Docs. Okay, I'm going to keep it fairly short. I'm going to add it to our site navigation. I'm going to say create. And when I do this, you're actually going to see that um, now we've added it to our navigation up here. We've got this that's happened, but you'll also see that there's a URL up here. This is when we started talking about that limit to how long that URL can be up until this point right here can be 400 characters. So all of this here can be no more than 400 characters. That's why we've got this limitation. Um, when we look at this, I've got basically it looks like a SharePoint list, except this has been twisted to focus on file base. So unlike a normal list where you would go in here and you'd say new item, in this case, we're saying new and we're getting file type objects. Our file objects are our typical folder, so we can build a folder. We also can build blank Word documents, Excel documents, all that kind of stuff if we want to right in here. Um, and then we can also drag files in here. So I'm going to just, um, for the sake of this, I'm going to build a new one. And I'm going to say, um, I'm going to create a new manuals folder. I'm going to go inside of here. And now on my computer, let me drag this window over here. I've actually got, I've got a series of manuals. These are all manuals for, these are in different languages, same manual, but in multiple languages. Maybe I've got a product that I'm building. 
I'm going to build all these out and I'm going to just take these and I'm going to drag them right onto the screen and it's going to upload them automatically for me. So you can see in the background, it is uploading these nine items. It is going to do this process. I can click on this and it's going to tell me where everything is at. And it's just going to kind of chug along as we, as we see fit. While that's going on, I'm going to show you a couple of other things. We talked about being able to synchronize these files so that we can see them offline or access them in other methods. So I'm going to click on this sync button right here. I'm going to allow this to open up my OneDrive application. When I do this, it's going to pop open OneDrive. It's happening on my other screen and it's going to automatically start syncing. So now if I go to my files, you're going to see here that I now have a new Contoso folder here. And this Contoso is, this is the name of our environment or our company that we have. And inside of that, we have our communication site manuals folder. Because I synchronized only this folder, I'm going to get all the files. And you'll see that as the files start populating here, you're going to start seeing them populate here all automatically. So this is how you can get some of that offline access to this data when we're working on this. I can, I can easily go into this. If I've got multiple folders, I'll be able to see all these folders um, and be able to access the information that I want. You'll also see that I have my OneDrive folders. So these are my OneDrives. This is, uh, I have set up um, the OneDrive access like you would normally have. And I've got my documents here. Now these documents were actually added outside of this environment. I actually added these documents to share or to the OneDrive web interface on another computer. And it automatically added in the information on this screen right here. Um, I also have my pictures redirected. I could redirect my desktop very easily by going here and saying um, to go, I'm going to go to my OneDrive settings screen, which is going to open up my settings here. And inside of here, I have the backup option and I can manage my backup, which will. Gerald, is there any yep. way you can zoom in on that a little bit? It's just a little small. Um, can't on the, uh, let me see here. Let me try this. <clears throat> that better? Much better, yes. Thank okay. you. Yep. So inside of here, I've already got my documents and my pictures being set up for backup. Um, I can very easily just add my desktop to this. And when I say start backup, what it will do, because I've got this file open, it won't let it back up. Um, I'm just going to skip this file for now and close this. Say OK on this. And now you'll see that it added a desktop folder. And this desktop folder is going to have all my files on it that I want to have uh, or that are sitting on my desktop. It will automatically add them in here. Uh, if I add files to this, they'll automatically get built on my desktop also. So, so Gerald, one of the, as we're since we're talking about the kind of the the personal, uh, this is a, I I always get trying to be real clear. It's the personal OneDrive, but yet it's the company. It's really the company OneDrive assigned to you as an individual, right? So that's it's it's difficult to say, uh, communicate that because Microsoft also allows you to have a personal personal OneDrive versus a personal company OneDrive. So. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, but you'll notice as Gerald's highlighting there, it's OneDrive dash company name is the um, company OneDrive assigned to you as an individual. So uh, I got further clarity on the question. Um, a couple items relative to this is one. Well, what if an, a, someone leaves the organization um, and what if people are saving information here um, that's important and we as a company might need to go and access it at some point again if they leave the organization or what if they accidentally delete something there that they didn't mean to like is it backed up is there a way to get access to it is there a way to get it after they leave um, can you talk about that a little bit yep so that data is accessible um, if you use any of the built-in microsoft security realms uh, so the if it's let me clarify this when we're talking about OneDrive in this scenario we are talking about the company managed OneDrive as Nate just clarified um, versus the personal OneDrive so when we talked about moving all that data to OneDrive we're talking about using it the OneDrive for business is officially what they call it um, is using this OneDrive for business side of things if a employee leaves and we want access to that data 
in the sequence where when you do a uh, when you start deprovisioning that user in in your 365 one of the items that you can run is take this data and make it someplace else so you can either copy it to another person's onedrive you can copy it to um to a sharepoint library you can open it up you can download it you can do some of that kind of stuff so you can gain access to that information um, as a user yes this information is backed up so i have my data if i go to my documents here i also get the ability to be able to look at this and say um, i can look at my like my version history when i pull up my version history it's actually going to pull up online all the version histories that have ever happened on this so if i were to upload uh, or if I were to re-modify this file, it would automatically start saving all my histories. So this actually gives the employee the action of being able to do those restores without having to bring somebody else in. Um, additionally, if, you, uh, if you're concerned about the data that might be out there and you want to start um, running some scans, that kind of stuff, there are functions that happen inside of the, um, um, the, the Microsoft Compliance Center, uh, which is part of the, of the platform. The compliance center will actually let you do scans for content or language and you can actually say i don't want this kind of content on onedrive and it will actually block that kind of stuff or it will notify you that somebody has this content inside of onedrive um, so you can actually kind of build some rules and build some security structures to help protect from that information that if you have certain uh, roles that you're worried about that information being out there you can actually lock a lot of that down it's getting a little bit more advanced than what we're going to get into here, but uh, definitely um, there's a lot of capabilities there for being able to find that information or to be able to scan it for content that you might be don't want out there. Okay, I've um, so going back to our communication site here. Um, so this is our communication site. I've uploaded these files now. I've done some of this. You can see that by default, I do have some light level metadata that is associated by when was it last modified and who was it last modified by. I also have this add column. If you attended our, our lists uh, session, you'll understand what this means. This actually gives us the ability to add metadata in this scenario. So um, I'm gonna add another column here and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call it a choice item. So, cause I wanna be able to choose what this is. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this is the language, right? I'm going to say, what languages is this manual written in? I'm going to give it a couple of languages here by default. I'm going to say, um, say English, and I'm going to say, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what other ones I have here. I have French. I'm going to say, um, oh, I don't remember what all these are. Um, going to give it three languages. I can have as many of these as I want. You can see that I can add multiples in here. I can also say, do I want to allow somebody to add a, va man a value that is not part of this list? So I can actually check this. So if somebody adds one that's maybe somebody's going to add an Italian one, they can actually type in Italian in there instead of choosing from this list. Uh, we can choose if there's a default value that we want to specify this with. Right now I'm going to say none. Um, and then there is a couple of additional options here. So we can say, what does this look like? Is it a drop down menu? Is it a radio button? Do we allow multiple selections? I think this is one of the coolest fields. I can't believe they make this an advanced feature, but I can say allow multiple selections. Maybe I have a manual that's actually in multiple languages. I can say allow this multiple selections. And then depending upon how I filter this, I can actually see that for both of those languages. This goes right back to the point that I was making earlier where we have this, this file, instead of copying it into each one of those languages or each one of those folders, I can put it in one folder and now give it visibility as though it is in multiple folders. Um, I also have, this is that require button, right? Do I want to require this information or do I want to make it optional? So right now I'm going to leave this optional so we can just see what happens. I will make this required here in a little bit. So when I say save on this, you'll see that immediately I get my language column here and I can go into all of these fields and I can actually click on one of these. This looks really different because it's in a small screen. So give me a sec here. Um, 
I'm going to go to details here, which is going to open up my details screen. This is going to give me my preview of some of the information that's inside there. But I'm going to go down here, and you can see here that I've got this language field now. And I can choose what I want to have this in. So I'm just going to say German, even though I don't think it's actually German. Um, just going to pick a couple of these and put these into a couple of languages. So we can show you what this looks like. And this one here. I'm going to say that this is a dual language. Oop. I'm going to say that this is a dual language one. This is in English and French because maybe we have it in Canada. Oop. So you can see here that now that I've selected both of those, you can see that it double highlights. Um, and this one here, I'm just going to do one more. I'm just going to say English only. OK, so now we have this. We can actually start looking at this data now and we can either um, filter by so we can easily just go in here and we can say, you know what? I only want the English ones. And you can see that when I say apply, I only get the ones that are tagged with English. Immediately, I can start using this information, you know, to find the find what I'm looking for. I can even go into this and I can say instead of saying filter by in this kind of. can do a computer. Um, instead of just doing it in a filter um, setting, I can actually even do a search inside of here and say, I want English manuals, and it will actually pull up this documentation. And the Contoso demo environment is uh, <laughs> working very it's quickly being, today. Exactly. It's going to be so friendly for me. OK, well, we'll skip that for now. Um, but I can I can very easily just by taking these filters, I can choose what I'm looking for and, and how I want to filter this. I can also take this now and I can say I want to build a view. So you can see right now that I've got this listed as all documents. Maybe I want to save this view as, because this view has got a filter on it, and I'm going to say um, English. Okay, I can make this public, make this view public, so that means that anybody has access to this, not not public as in anybody on the internet, right? But public to anybody who has access to this uh, document store actually has the ability to see um, this view that I'm creating, or I can uncheck that and make it just for myself. I'm just going to go here and I'm going to say English. And now by changing this, I can go back to all documents and you can see that it brings back that view um, into this. So this is one of the ways that I've seen people get around the folder issue is instead of building all these folders to put all these languages in, you can actually go inside of here and you would build views instead of those folders that actually change what information you're looking for. This is this is where I think it gets really cool is you can really get into um, being able to sort and filter data, provide different views in the way we do things. I know we do one internally where we actually have some of our published um, process documents um, stored inside SharePoint. We actually use this the same uh, metadata process and a single document might be part of multiple processes. So we actually can sort and filter that, although it's all inside of one, uh, one structure, we can see what we want to you know, we can see what only the documents that are tied to that process that we're looking for. Now, one of the things I want to point out here is I am synchronizing this folder to my computer. You can see here right now that you can't actually see any of that metadata. And if I were to pull up even the, the computer properties on one of these files, none of that information is even shown here. Even if I were to go into the, the details, none of that actually really shows for anything that we're looking at. So this pretty cool how can we you know if we take the um, I'm going to take this field now and I'm actually going to edit this column and one of those settings that we had before was to require this column to have information right so I'm going to say yes to this and so language is now required I'm going to go back to our view here and go back to all documents and one of the things that you'll 
should happen here is I can go to files that need attention. And what files that need attention are going to do is it's going to come up now. Now that I'm requiring that field to be in here, you can see that language missing is actually getting highlighted. So now I can immediately go into these documents and start saying, oh, this is a document I need to update this information for. Ah, this one here, I know this one is English. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to say, okay, that one's English. And now that is resolved and it's now back to normal. And I can go back in here and I can say, show me all my documents again. And it's going to show me all the information. It's going to highlight the ones that have got required fields. But now that we made that required, can I still copy new files in remotely? So I'm going to go back up to my, my manual stock here. Uh, not that one. Um, this one here. And I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to just try to add it into my OneDrive. Paste this file in there. Um, copied all my files in. That's not going to work. So let me let me pick a different file and upload it into this folder. So I'm just going to take this file list here that I've got. I'm going to put that inside this folder here. And when I do this, you know, this is always the fun part of a live demo. Is you find <laughs> out that something happens that uh, you were unaware of. It actually looks like Microsoft maybe has adjusted this feature. Um, normally, I would have gotten a, you can't upload this because there is a restriction in place but it is now uploading it with a required info tag. Um, learn something new every day that is requiring me to update the information for my file. Wow. Yeah, cool. Joe, I found too, when I've done some <laughs> demo stuff like this, I found it where there's a, there's a little bit of a delay for all the different functions across the system to synchronize where the, those things might pop in. But yeah, that, that could be part of it too. It, it could very well be that it just hasn't um, refreshed the the required info side right. of things yet. Exactly. So it might be that it's not actually accepting that information yet, but it it will at some point in time. Um, I do know that there is an open request out there for Microsoft to address this that will actually allow that. Um, and they're trying to even write it into, you know, to give you a little bit of vision into the roadmap. When you drop this in, they're actually talking about popping a window that will ask you for the attributes um, or for that metadata. Um, but it is not in there yet, but we may see that in the coming months, two years. So, so Gerald, I wonder if you might be able to illustrate um, something uh, quickly sure. because it's a question that came up that was follow up earlier, but I thought where you were going, it might, uh, it's applicable now, which is uh, if, so you're syncing things from SharePoint to OneDrive and can uh, someone delete something in the OneDrive? So it's syncing to the local machine. So you might have multiple people on your team syncing that, can you delete something like maybe that file uh, list that you just um, added? Yep. Can you delete that? Uh, can a user, end user, uh, a team member delete that and does it then delete the sync to OneDrive? So it does not delete the sync to OneDrive, it deletes the, the file thing. in OneDrive. So one of the things that you'll see here is that yeah. file that was there is no longer there. So, uh oh, right, something disappeared. Um, it actually isn't gone. It's still there. Um, you just need to be able to recover that file. And one of the ways to do that is, let's see if I can pull this up easily. Um, they keep moving it on me. There is a way to do it. It is to find the inside of one of these menus someplace there is a recycle bin that we can actually pull that back from um is it right there restore from library yeah i just saw that i think that's actually where it's at is inside of here so you do have to have a certain um certain rights feature for this um but when we do that so yeah, I can say I want to restore this library to a certain time frame. I can actually say when do I want to restore this library to, um, and I can even see what has changed in here. And I want to say I want to restore it to just before this happened, right? 
So I'm actually going to choose. Um, actually, I think I just want to restore this item. Change in the list below to highlight it. Yep, this should restore back my file. But this is also really convenient if you did have one of those, um, you know, if you had like a, a malware event or somebody went rogue on you and deleted all the documents inside there, you can just go back to the point in time where you know everything was good and you can choose that and it will restore back all of those files. So uh, there is a recycle bin. I know you're talking about it. Yeah, there, it's there's just... a recycle bin too. And, and I. Last I remember, there was a spot for it. I just I don't know where they've put it. There's my file list is back now. Um, I would have to follow up with that. I know that it's available. I just don't know where it's at offhand. Yeah, the other thing that I would add, Gerald, it's a public service announcement that we like to talk about when we talk about deletions and changes and things like that, is that, um, and to your knowledge, has Microsoft changed their policy? Or can you talk about third-party backups of, of, of SharePoint and the Microsoft 365 environment so people know what, they should look out for there. Yep. So this is this is one of those things that uh, Microsoft doesn't really tell you, right? So they tell you, hey, here's all these really cool ways of restoring back the data. But one of the things that they don't make real evident is that they only keep it for so long. So if you were to delete that file, that file may go away, depending on your settings, in as little as 15 days, 45 days, depending upon the base settings. Um, but yeah, some of that document, some of that documentation can go away. Um, there are also ways of technically editing some of this information um, through through APIs that don't actually keep revisions or keep some of that that data stored in a certain way. So there are risks associated with being able to have something that's outside that Microsoft environment. Um, one of the other ones that I heard the other day, even for people wanting to back this up, is um, or using some kind of a third-party backup platform is. If Microsoft is down for a long period of time, we have seen glitches in the past. It's been a it's been a while now, but we have seen glitches in the past where we have seen multi-hour outages. And if you had documents inside there that were critical for your business operation, how do you gain access to that document? Most backup platforms let you just download the file outside of that system, so you could continue working if there ever was some kind of an outage that that went for longer periods of time. Um, multiple hours, multiple days, um, maybe even have impacts in other other sides of things. So, um, you know, there are there are there is value in backing up outside of just doing this. So this is not this is not necessarily uh, I don't like to call this backup um, as much as just recovery of documents that you accidentally deleted. Um, and so. Gerald, Michael just sent me a message letting him know that the recycle bin is in site contents. He just found it. Ah. OK, so yeah, inside of site contents, this is where we'd actually get to the recycle bin of stuff. Um, so yeah, there, there's a couple of ways. Far right corner, right Gerald, yep. upper right, yep. there you go. Right there, OK. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one of them. I don't know if that's the right one. This might actually be if we could delete a page. Um, but anyways, there are ways to get the data back. Um, on top of it, there are also um, you know, we've talked about this many times in our other docu uh, in our many of our training sessions is um, the versioning and the capabilities of being able to pull this up. So if I actually pull up this document, I can see version history for this document. This will show me every time that that file is saved um, and who saved it and what's happened. Uh, if there was any comments committed to that, some of those kinds of things. Um, there's a lot of those kinds of actions that can also be listed inside of here to uh, to kind of build these structures. So if I were to modify this document, it would actually give me a copy of it. If I actually sort this by name, I uploaded a new version of this document. So if I go to version history, I should actually see uh, it actually identified it as the same one. So it's actually smart enough to understand when some of these um, some of these documents are updated. Um, but if I were to modify like this file list, it would actually show me a update as to what's going on. So I just deleted all of this document because I hit the wrong keys. That has now been uploaded to Microsoft. Oh my gosh, what happens? You know, four days later, I'm lost. I, you know, freaking out because I've now lost this document. 
I can see right here that this is the history of everything that's happened. So this file got uploaded. I then set the language to French. You can see that that actually gets happens in here. So this information gets logged. Um, and then I also have this, this data right here. I can actually go right back to this one and I can say, I want to restore this version of the document. And when I do this, it now has put this document up. I just got a little flash over on my computer screen that said that this document was being updated. And if I open up this document again, you can see that all my data is back. Um, that's how cool and how fast that works. I, I, it's a great feature. Um, so yeah, and then you can also see, you know, for anybody who has not seen the OneDrive features, we can see our status of all of our files. These files that are in the cloud, they're only in the cloud, so I don't actually have this file being stored on my computer. It's strictly in the cloud side of things. Get the green circle, it means that I have cached that file, but it can be removed. Maybe I want to keep this file always on my computer. I can right click on this file. And I can say always keep on this device, and you'll see that this icon is going to change. And what it's going to do is it's going to constantly synchronize it in the background and watch for changes to this file and keep that file up to date on my computer. So if I ever disconnect from the internet, I'll be able to see that file right there. Okay, I know we're kind of at time here, so um, are there additional questions that have come up? Cheryl, there was one that came up earlier and I it, it, it wasn't uh, um, I, I didn't want to it was would have changed the flow at the time, so I didn't interject it. Um, but there I think there's a good question that you talked about a little bit ago, which earlier in the session, which is how does the communication site relate to teams? Um, you know, for instance, does a business have multiple communication sites or just one, um, you know, like a big umbrella on, on a server? Um, and I think I think part of it is the relation to as you're as you're probably setting up your ways to show this is that there are SharePoint sites that are connected to Teams, and there are just SharePoint sites that are that are SharePoint sites that are part in part of your organization um, that are not connected to Teams. And so um, there's permissioning there. There's there's other stuff. So um, yeah, can you talk about that and and yep. either show or demonstrate that a little bit, please? Yeah. So um, so there are. There are multiple types of sites inside SharePoint. Um, there is something called, I'm actually just going to go to our SharePoint um, admin page here quick. So I can kind of show what these are and what the structures are. So the two kind of, the two primary site types that are out there are team sites and communication sites. Team sites are really focused around being the backend infrastructure of Microsoft Teams. So if I were to open up inside of Microsoft Teams a, you know, a team, um, let me just grab my, grab my Teams engine here. And if I were to go into Microsoft Teams and then pull up a team and go to like files, for example, this is all actually SharePoint in the background. This is all being done in, in the environment. And it's really easy to see this because if I click here and I say open in SharePoint, this is actually going to open up that page in SharePoint. And one of the things that you'll notice here is I'm looking at a site called Contoso and a shared documents structure of this. This site's Contoso is actually a team site. So it is a site that is tied to teams in the background. What that means is that means that the security of this Teams site is all controlled by Teams essentially. So it's all 365 um, based groups. If I create a, um, if I go to add a user into this, I can add users into it um, all through the Teams interface. I can remove users through the Teams interface, but if I add a user to this environment, they gain access to it and everybody is at the same permission level and that is full access to it essentially, right? There's you, you get read write access to all the data contained there within. So obviously not something you're going to want to do if you want any kind of tracking of change or control in access of that data. Um, communication sites are the other side of this. So communication sites are, um, if we look at our types of sites here, um, so you can see here that these templates here 
our team sites, communication sites. Um, there's even a document center that you can build. Um, a document center is a communication site that's focused around documents, obviously. Um, it'd be one of those ways that you could actually um, build a document center if you wanted to, to store all of your, all of your document libraries. Um, but these team sites are all going to get tied to those teams, uh, to Microsoft Teams, ultimately. One of the things that, um, um, how do I put this? The, um, you can build a team site outside of Teams. But when you do, it follows all the same rules as Teams does. So, um, it ultimately would be for connecting it to Teams in the future, but um, a team site is always still going to follow those same rules as to one permission stack, all of that kind of stuff. These communication sites are going to have all that additional layer of complexity for security, automation, those kinds of things. Uh, most of your communication sites are also going to come with a default communication look, um, message lists, that kind of stuff. If I actually go to... Um, I go to the one that we had out there. So this is the document center template. It's got kind of a similar look, but it's still very focused around documents. Um, one of the things I'm not a big fan of the document center is it follows some of the more legacy SharePoint looks now, which means that you kind of have some limitations as to how you can make these pages act um, and features that you can make it work. Uh, one of the things that Microsoft has done in the last year and a half or so is really updated to this new modern interface. Um, uh, they call it modern, um, but it is it is this new modern interface really does give more detail as to what the uh, what the screen looks like and, and or what you can do with it and how you can do some of those things. Like we created that a document library earlier and um, down here you can see that there's like a document feature. Like these are the most recently modified documents that have happened inside the system. I can actually go inside of this and modify this so it actually tied to that document library we just added. And when we add documents to it, it's automatically going to show up down here. So we can always, we can kind of build dynamic content that's always showing information that's happening to people that come into these sites. Yeah, and the biggest thing, Gerald, and I think I'll, I'll interject another question here, um, is that uh, <sighs> You can you can you can link and again that's it's kind of a, a foreground conclusion. But um, if you have a communication site that's not directly connected to Teams, there's ways to link those communication sites into Teams for people to be able to see and access. But the biggest difference is that you have a little bit more flexibility and granular control in the communication site, whereas Teams is kind of like if you're a member of the team, you have access to read and write. Um, and so it's it's different in that regard. Um, yep. So hey, I'm trying. Yeah, go ahead. Before um, before you go to the next question, just a housekeeping thing. I, it seems that there's some attendees who don't have the chat panel um, for some reason. We'll investigate that for the next one. But so I just wanted to let people know if you're not seeing the chat panel in order to answer or input a question, please just raise the hand in the upper part of the screen and then we can make sure that you get your question in there as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so that's a good good question. So there's actually a question that comes out and it's probably one of the most common ways we see where a communication site makes sense, uh, or at least one reason for it is so can files from a team site get saved to the communication site, say they're in there finalized some way. So I think this gets from a, a source document collaboration in a team site and then you might produce them or or publish them to a communication site, you know, when they're ready to be launched to the rest of the organization. Short answer is yes, but Gerald, do you want to talk about that at all a little further? Um, yeah, so there are um, there's a couple of different ways of doing kind of that source to destination kind of conversion. Um, you can either do various types of automation um, if it's if that file type is not changing at all. Um, but many times we actually define using that as part of the process of moving that document across. Right? Is is actually having somebody many times they're converting it to a template or you're you're putting it into a an additional read-only format, something like a PDF, and you're watermarking it, um, something like that, where you're actually putting that document across into into uh, uh, from Teams into SharePoint. Um, so there are ways of doing that. There is another way of doing that actually, where you can also um, inside of Teams, you can actually link 
um, additional cloud storage. And Nate, do you happen to have one offhand that you've already linked or? Uh, probably yeah, not. Maybe not. Teams, so, maybe, yeah. Otherwise, just okay. I'll just I'm just going to add another SharePoint here. So I'm inside of a team. I'm inside the files area. I'm just going to add a cloud storage. And inside of here, I'm just going to say another SharePoint environment. And when I say another SharePoint environment, I'm just going to go find my. Um, I need a link here, so I'm just going to go back to my browser. I go to my product docs. I'm going to grab this link. And then back to my teams. I'm going to give it my library URL. And when I do this, it's going to say, here's my communication site that I wanted. Next, I want the product docs. Boom. I've got this communication site product docs. This is going to take me, when I click on this, it's going to take me right to um, that SharePoint site. So I can very easily go back and forth between those documents that I have inside that SharePoint site and here too. So this might be one of those scenarios. Um, maybe I've got, you know, these, these product documents. I need my support desk to also see this, but this may be the team that I'm in right now is, is the, the group that writes those documents. We want to be able to have that easy access to be able to publish that document, drag it in there, modify it, do some of that kind of stuff. But the support team can see that data also. Um, because it's inside the SharePoint site, not just strictly inside Teams. So this is this is probably one of those, you know, um, the data itself is being stored inside SharePoint, um, but the visibility of it is where we're kind of breaking those rules of, you know, Teams uh, permissions, right? So um, if I don't have permissions to see this data and I'm in Teams, um, I would not see this data either. So even if I clicked on that, it would still not give me access to that data because it is following, it is signing into that communication site as me. So kind of a kind of a, a noodle of a of a of process as to how that would all work. It's also a way that, you know, like you said, Gerald, um, not only for the team that's producing that, but you know, if you're a part of the marketing team and you need access to the communication site versus the sales team versus the finance team versus any of these teams, you could be linking that there. And so it's just a, a, a faster way for your team to be able to access the company wide communication site documents uh, so that they're not having to click out of a team into a different SharePoint site or into different teams in order to access the information. You can provide those those multiple links. So yep. um, that's I appreciate that. One of the things too, there's two other quick questions that have come through. Um, I think you can address first. Uh, if there's lots of files in a SharePoint site, um, uh, it's it, the question is, doesn't that make the OneDrive for Business difficult to use? Um, so I think there's a couple layers there. Um, but do you want to try and address that? Yes, yes, it does. Um, so I, I think this is this is a um, this is the the trick that I recommend, and this is this is where metadata makes that difficult, right? Is if you are using metadata instead of folders, um, is that folder structure maybe gets uh, gets a little unwieldy, um, or that metadata not being able to use that metadata, there is that lots of files kind of area. So this may this is one of the areas where combining folders and metadata is beneficial many times. Um, there is also a another feature that we really didn't get into today called document sets. And what document sets do is they actually allow you to kind of combine. It's almost folders for metadata um, is probably the best I'm going to be able to explain it. But you can actually um, one of the ways to basically put it is a document set could ultimately contain um, if you had like a, if you're a manufacturing organization and you had a job that you had done and that job contains POs and, you know, um, various other documents, you know, schematics and job duties and BOMs and all of that kind of stuff that goes into building that, that, that job, you could actually create a document set for that job that would then contain all of that data, but still follow the metadata rules of the primary group and you can synchronize individual document sets which might solve some of that issue but i don't know that that's you know we kind of have to play through that really to kind of see what that is but yes it ultimately the one drive for business synchronization side with lots of files is difficult um, there is another thing just to kind of note most people haven't run into this but there is an existing limitation out there 
you have more than I believe it's 10,000 items inside of your SharePoint site, um, it doesn't work either. So if you have more than 10,000 files inside of your system and you're trying to synchronize that, OneDrive for Business will complain about it. So um, that's per folder that it's trying to synchronize. So that's one of the other ways to do that is break up that document library either into multiple document libraries or multiple folders and then being able to synchronize each of those separately. Yeah, that, that was kind of where um, I was going if is the uh, having the multiple folders or document libraries is one way to look at it and then and then trying to manage through OneDrive what is actually synced and exists on your machine versus what is like um, just a, a, a link or the cloud link to it um, as a shortcut yep. kind of speak. So um, but yeah, that's that's good. Uh, good question on that. Um, I've got another simple one here, and then uh, I think we're we're pretty much out of questions. But it just came back. So, how, can, how can you show how to upload an attachment from email to SharePoint? I think you might have mentioned something about that, but someone asked about it. Can you sh can you upload an attachment from email to SharePoint? And maybe that's a drag and drop, or maybe there's a function that I'm not even aware of. So, can you talk about that? Um, you know, there is probably a drag and drop. Um, That's a good one. Um, no, I'm trying to think about that. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> there's probably a rule maybe you could do, but I was trying to think if there's some way to. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have Outlook. Um, yeah, you probably in the demo environment. You don't have Outlook pulled up. Yeah, probably. I'm. I'm just going to activate my Outlook here quick and let that kind of start processing while I do something else here quick. Um, I'm just going to go to Outlook Online. If I remember correctly, you can actually go to an attachment. I just don't know if I have any attachments in here either, which will be the next. So one. I actually um, I pulled up my Outlook here, Joel, with an attachment. And when I see an attachment here, I can. There's a little drop down next to it. Yep. And I click on that, and it says upload attachment or upload all attachments because there's two in this one. And it does give me the option either to dump it directly into OneDrive, or it actually is pulling up my different. Um, uh, teams uh, uh, that I'm a part of, and I can choose a group right right there to be able to do it. So, um, and I can I can choose which which team it goes into. Um, so that is kind of interesting. I didn't even know you could do that. But um, yeah, I, I would probably flag that as that feature exists if you're using the, um, for lack of better terms, what I what I call the modern version of right. the Office apps. Yep. So if you're on the M365 um, or the O365 SKUs and you're actually installing the Office app through that and not through any of the legacy editions, um, any of the older versions, um, that would be, that feature I believe has been added because that's also, like you also get a lot of the same features for being able to, um, you get a lot of the same features to be able to do, um, like even right out of Word, you can just you can go directly right to, to saving yeah. right into SharePoint. Um, so a lot of that is is far more efficient to do some of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm looking right now to see if I can show this here quick. Yeah, and Gerald, as you're doing that, it, it's yep. it is there is some significant differences if you're using a the, the, the version of uh, Office licensing that, that basically is synchronized from Microsoft 365, so you're getting your license, your Office subscription through through Microsoft in that regard, versus some of the, um, if you bought it separately, there there's there are some connections that Microsoft is doing yep. uh, to make it easier for on-premise applications like Word, Excel, et cetera, to save to and open from uh, SharePoint sites and OneDrive sites or libraries. I'm just building an email here um, with an attachment, sending it to myself so I can show you here. And while Gerald's doing that, uh, this will be the last thing we'll show because we are over our time that we had uh, asked from everybody. So we appreciate that. We always want to be respectful of folks' time, but we also want to continue asking questions or answering questions if we can. Uh, so um, we uh, this is going to be recorded. 
and uh, again, this will be sent out afterwards. So, uh, and and Stephanie had posted links in the chat, and we will also send this in the follow up. Um, that uh, to we have a landing page that has all of the power user previous recordings and future events. Um, and and watch Gerald. I guess I'll just pause Gerald since you're doing it. But yeah, it was the upload. Yep, there you go. Yep. So right here, I can either choose it to OneDrive, or I can say more. Um, if you had more groups there or more sites there, like I had a yeah. whole bunch of sites from different ones I did ac I'd accessed. Um, I yeah, it that. might be just because my it still has not fully f finished synchronizing this yet, so it probably would be there. Um, and if I say save attachments, not that one. If I say save as, if I go inside of here. If I do have the OneDrive connection, I can I can see my communication site here, so I could add it that way. Right, that would be one of the ways of doing it. Um, I don't have the same. Notice there's an upload option right yeah, above that. There's... Even right above it, there's a in the in the menu bar at the top. There's an right there. Yeah, there's yep. probably the same thing, but I mean, just it's another place where you can yep. grab it. Another place that you can drop it. So yeah, that would be all part of that. So thanks for showing that, Gerald. Thanks for the yep. questions, everyone. Uh, again, as, as I mentioned, Stephanie uh, is going to be sending out a follow-up email that has a link to the recording as well as links to our um, the YouTube uh, page. And we keep a playlist, so these will play in, uh, in order um, if you ever go out and just watch these on YouTube versus on our website. Uh, but either way, thanks a lot. We do have our next session uh, on the last Friday of April, which is April 30th at 1 o'clock Central Time, 12 uh, Mountain Time. Uh, and by all means, you can sign up for getting notifications of those at our on our sign up for those at, at our website, or if you want to subscribe to any of our communications, uh, that's what a lot of our communications are is about these kinds of events. <laughs> so if you want to receive these um, uh, notifications, um, just please do that. And um, we'll sign off for today. Gerald, any final thoughts before we stop the yeah. recording? No, I, I'm excited to uh, to seeing people starting to use SharePoint more and the features behind it. So thanks for attending. All right. Thanks, everybody. Make it a great day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Um.